Galatians chapter 3. Let me read verses 15 through 22. Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 22. Here's what it says. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The Articles of Confederation was first proposed by the Second Continental Congress in 1777, and upon ratification by all the states, it went into effect in the year 1781. From 1781 until 1787, this was our nation's first constitution. It was our founding father's first attempt to draft a document that would define a new system of government. But there were glaring issues with these Articles of Confederation. There was no executive branch, and therefore no single person to take the lead as far as foreign affairs are concerned. Each state had only one vote in this unicameral Congress, regardless of their size. Congress had no power to tax. (laughs) Congress had no power to regulate trade, foreign or domestic. There was no judicial branch and no national court system. Most power rested with the states. Federal power was greatly restricted. There was no national currency. Listen, basically the issue, the situation was this. Our nation functioned as really more of a friendly cooperative rather than a United States. It was more like an independent states of America. Were it not for the Revolutionary War, really, not much else was uniting us under the Articles of Confederation. So it became quite apparent between 1781 and 1787 that there were serious problems with these Articles of Confederation. So a constitutional convention was called in 1787. It was determined that the articles were really beyond repair. There was nothing that could be done to resurrect the Articles of Confederation. They were scrapped, thrown in the circular file, and they would start anew. At this constitutional convention, of course, in 1787, this is where they drafted the document that governs our nation today the Constitution of the United States of America. Do you see the connection between what I have just described and what may seem to you to be the paradox of law and grace? Do you see the connection? I hope not. I hope you don't see the connection because the situation involving God's covenant is not what happened when God gave the covenant of grace. The need for a new covenant is not what happened when God gave that covenant of grace to Abraham. God didn't say, oops, the law thing didn't work out so well. We would better have a, something new. We better replace that one. There are some obvious reasons. First of all, God doesn't make mistakes. The law wasn't a mistake. Rather, the next step in God's plan of redemption would be fulfilled in Christ. That plan took its next step in the economy of God's salvation plan. The next step would be taken in order for Christ to fulfill the law that had been given. 
So maybe we're having a hard time. Maybe you're having a hard time reconciling this whole matter of law and grace. Maybe you're wondering if the takeaway is this. Law is bad. Grace is good. God's covenant with Abraham is good. God's covenant with Moses, bad. Well, that would be the wrong perspective. Because how could this be so if God created the law, God gave the law, and all that God creates is good and perfect? You can't conclude, therefore, that the law was bad. Actually, Paul is going to show in these verses that the law and grace are not competing principles at all. In fact, they are complementary principles. We should see today that in God's economy of salvation that there is actually, listen, a collaboration of law and grace. Not the kind of collaboration that the Judaizers were proposing, mind you, but there is a collaboration of law and grace. And I hope we can see what this collaboration is today. Now, just a side note. I hope that you are feeling like you are being enriched by this study in Galatians. I hope that you are feeling the same sense of a deepening understanding, that we're diving deeper into the issue. Paul has a way of really beating things to death. However, he has something very important that he wants us to learn here, and I hope that it's settling in. I hope that you're thinking about it beyond these walls in here. I was encouraged this weekend. Our family was together for dinner. And um, we had one particular child who was being a little bit of a scooch. He's being a little bit nudgy. And, um, and after I had to take corrective action on a, a couple of times, then all of a sudden one of my children says, Hey, listen, should you go on sinning so that grace may abound? And, and there was this collective, certainly not. Of course, that child was uh, quoting from Romans chapter 6, verse 1. <laughs> Must have been one of the parallel texts that we encountered in our study. So for today, there are two principles concerning the law and grace that need to be understood. Number one is this, that the law is inferior to the covenant of promise. Now, if we developed the point last week that the covenant of promise, by God's grace, is superior, then we can conclude then that the covenant of the law is inferior. Not bad, just inferior. We'll see why. And then that there is a collaboration of law and grace. Verse 19, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. So why? Why is the law inferior to the covenant of promise? Well, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it was temporary. It was temporary. It was added because of transgressions. It says, until the offspring should come. We understand this verse in this way, that the law was meant to prepare humanity for the work of the Messiah. And what would that preparation look like? Well, we'll get into this later on in the passage. But to put it quite simply, the law was designed to show the children of Israel just how utterly incapable they were of keeping it. There was absolutely no way they could keep the hundreds of laws that had been given to them perfectly. The bottom line is this, that the law was proof of man's inability to save himself. He needed a savior. And so the law was given until the offspring should come. We know who the offspring was. That, of course, was Jesus Christ. Paul told us that in verse 16. But the question is this. Why was the law given until the offspring should come? It's because only the offspring could satisfy the law. Only Jesus Christ could do what needed to be done to satisfy every single element of that law. How did he do that? 
He lived a life perfectly. Not one sin. He fulfilled the law in that way by becoming sin. When he went to the cross and was nailed to it. So only the offspring could satisfy the law. And Christ did that on the cross. This is important to note that the law of Moses was not revoked when Jesus came. Jesus came, he said, to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Do not think that I have come, our Lord is speaking, to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So if we could summarize this, we are to understand that the law had an expiration date. And that expiration date was until the offspring should come. It was temporary. Until the offspring should come. Now, it was, it was to show us in that temporary time that our deficiencies exist and that we are completely unable to justify ourselves. God didn't ditch the law because he changed his mind or because he realized that he had made a subpar covenant with Moses. The law was always intended to be temporary in terms of pointing us to Christ. Though the death and and through the death and resurrection of Christ, the law was fulfilled and its righteous demands are fulfilled in us through the Holy Spirit of God. Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, Paul is writing, of course, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to one another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. And there's a second reason why the law is inferior to the promise. It's because, number two, it required a mediator. It required a mediator. Verse 19, the second portion of it. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Verse 20. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Paul here once again is referencing Old Testament scripture. And that of course would be Exodus chapter 19 verses 18 through 24 when God gave the law to Moses at Mount Sinai. A parallel text in the New Testament actually referenced this event. The giving and the application of the law are identified in Acts chapter 7 and Hebrews chapter 2. Acts chapter 7 verse 53 says, You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 2, For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. Here we see reference to the giving of the law and evidently the presence of angels who served as intermediaries. According to these texts and related texts, both those that are canonized and and those that are part of Jewish tradition, the law was delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai by the hands of angels. And so angels were seemingly this go-between or mediator for Moses and God when Moses received the law from God. And so, what does this mean and why does this matter? Well, here's the point. We're looking at this this, uh, collaboration of law and grace, right? We're looking at see how, to see how they relate to one another. And right now, we want to understand the inferiority of the law as it's compared to the covenant of grace, the covenant of promise. So here's what this means. Israel received the law third hand, from God, to angels, to Moses, then the people. And that's how it went. Why? Well, there are some possibilities. Perhaps it was because of the awesome nature in which that law was given. Now, I told you that Moses referenced, or uh, not Moses, but Paul rather referenced Exodus chapter 19. Let's flip on over there and we'll see how it was that the law was given. Exodus chapter 19, verses 18 through 24. Exodus chapter 19, verses 18 through 24. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. 
And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him, In thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. And let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai. For you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. Do you see the manner in which God gave the law to Moses? Do you see the tremendous power on display of Almighty God? Do you see that the mountain is consumed in smoke? Do you see that the the symbol of God as fire is firmly being described here? In other words, the law came and no one could approach God. God was seemingly impersonal, And God was keeping them at a distance. How does that compare to the giving of the covenant of promise to Abraham, which was personal, one-on-one? There was no grace in the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. In fact, Hebrews, I think it's chapter 12, describes Moses who is shaking in his sandals. Almighty God and all of his power was on full display. There was no grace at Mount Sinai. So what are we to understand here? Well, it says that the law was given and it required a mediator. My takeaway is this, that the giving of the law was done by God from a distance because it was impressive. It was frightening. There was no grace when the law was given. It was actually quite terrifying For Moses himself shook in his sandals. But when God made his covenant with Abraham, he did it personally and without a go-between. Why was that? Well, remember that the covenant of promise given to Abraham was a covenant of grace. It was a grace gift. It was a covenant that was made with no conditions. God made no promises To Abraham, he did it personally and with with no mediator, just God and Abraham. In other words, what I, I just misspoke. God required no promises from Abraham, but God definitely gave promises to Abraham. There was also no need for a go between. And perhaps most likely, when God gave the covenant to Abraham, he did so because the promise of salvation by faith. It was such a gracious gift by God that he wanted to do that personally with Abraham. And so we see this nature of the free gift of salvation. We see God who desires to approach Abraham in the same manner that he desires to approach everyone who would believe in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior with his divine offer of salvation. Consider verse 20 for a moment. Verse 20, now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. (laughs) Okay, in the course of my research this week, I found that there is, just as we encountered last week, there is uh, tremendous confusion regarding uh, verse 20 and the manner in which Paul delivered it to us under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. James Montgomery Boyce called Galatians 3.20, Probably the most obscure verse in Galatians, if not the entire New Testament. It's a tough verse to decipher from the Greek and then comprehend it in English. But given the context of these verses, here's where I land. That Moses needed a mediator between himself and God because of the awesome nature with which the law was given. It was given in thunder. It was given in smoke. The delivery of the law given in that manner, was designed to strike fear. It was designed to be terrifying. Why? So that we would despair over our own sin. But we as believers who have been saved by God's grace through faith 
don't need a mediator between us and the Lord Jesus. Why? Because he is our mediator. But let's not lose sight of the holy God that we do serve. Let's not forget how rich this grace is, which allows us to receive it without fear and without trepidation. The law was a two-party agreement brought by mediators, but salvation by faith because of God's grace is received through the promise of God's grace, which gave us his son. So if we could summarize this first point, we can see from these verses why the covenant of the law is inferior to the covenant of promise with Abraham. First, it requires a mediator, while the covenant that God made with Abraham was done through a personal encounter together with Abraham. We have also learned that the law was never meant to be our justifier, but rather a temporary driving force to propel us to the grace of God which saves because of the forgiveness that he offers through the sacrifice of his son Jesus on Calvary's tree. But there's a second principle to consider today, and that is the one that answers the question that Paul most likely was anticipating from those who were opposing him. All right, Paul, why then the law? Why the law? Couldn't God just have extended that covenant of grace to begin with? Why all the complication? Why introducing the law at this point? Well, consider the collaboration of law and grace. The collaboration of law and grace. Paul revealed his deep insight in these verses into the ways and the purposes of God. He didn't say that the law contradicts the promise, but rather that it cooperates with the promise in fulfilling the purposes of God. While law and grace seem to be contrary to one another, if we go deep enough, we're going to discover that they're not contrary at all. They actually complement one another. So why then was the law given? Well, there are many reasons, but let's consider three. Let's consider three as we close our time today in verses 19 through 22. First, why then the law? It is to show us that, number one, the law exposes our sin. The law exposes our sin. Verse 19, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. But the scripture imprisoned, verse 22, the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. It is here that we see the way that law and grace cooperate in bringing the lost sinner to Jesus Christ. The law shows the sinner his guilt, and grace shows the sinner forgiveness that he can have in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 7, verse 12. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Now, Paul writes that the law is not bad. He says it is, quote, holy, and righteous, and good. The problem is that we are unholy, we are unrighteous, and we are bad. So, the solution to that problem is not to expect someone who is unholy, unrighteous, and bad to do that which is holy and righteous and good. It just makes no sense. The law doesn't make us sinners. It reveals to us that we're already sinners. Consider what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3 verse 20, for by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And this is the point. The law exposes our wretchedness. The law exposes our depravity. So, It really does not get any clearer than that. The law cannot save because by no works of the law can anyone be declared righteous. And furthermore, who does that but the Holy Spirit of God at salvation anyway? But what does the law do? It doesn't save like we know. It doesn't justify. In fact, James, 
Remember, we're in our study last year. James personifies the law as a mirror. Consider James, flip over to James chapter 1 if you would. James chapter 1, verse 22. James chapter 1, verse 22. James is going to present the law as a mirror, as a mirror. James chapter 1, verse 22, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, that's God's word, God's law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. God's word is like a mirror for us. We look into it, and it points us back to who we really are. That's the purpose of the law. In other words, as a mirror, the law reveals our sin to us. And what we see in the mirror is intended to drive us. Not to work harder to be saved, but it's intended to drive us to the Savior, to Jesus Christ, whose blood cleanses us from all that is bad, from all that is unholy, and from all that is unrighteous. That's what the law does. It drives us to the Savior, who is the only one who could satisfy what was required for our sin. Consider also verse 22. It's a second purpose of the law. And that is to put us in jail. To put us in jail. The law puts us in jail. Verse 22, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin. Now, this is interesting from Paul as he paints a picture of imprisonment. The Apostle Paul once again is using the literary device of personification. This time presenting scripture as a jailer. The bars of the cell, that's sin. It keeps us confined. The scripture put us in the prison because it pointed out our sinful condition. And so there we sit in jail, imprisoned by our own sin. And what can help us? The law? No, it can do absolutely nothing to help us in our incarcerated state because that's what put us there in the first place. And why can't it do anything? Because the law puts you in jail. Maybe you, like many, might be thinking right now, hey, I'm not a prisoner to my sin. I've been set free from my sin. Well, if you're saved, yes, you have been set free from the bondage of sin, which brings death. But if you haven't, I'll offer you this. Go ahead and stop sinning. Go ahead, give it a whirl. Stop singing. Stop sinning. You can. In fact, those who are saved can't stop sinning. You can't stop sinning. And if you've ever had a record of sin, then you are imprisoned by the law of God. That's Paul's point. It puts us in jail. And only Jesus, the warden, can set us free from our bondage to sin because of faith by God's grace. It's our obedience to the law, God's law or His Word which is written on our hearts that invites the Holy Spirit's work of sanctification into our lives as we are more and more filled with His power to live for God's glory. And what brings him glory? Righteous living. Martin Luther, of course, adored Galatians. And, uh, and he said this. He said, when the law drives you to the point of despair, let it drive you a little farther. Let it drive you straight into the arms of Jesus who says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Paul tells us, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that the law shows us our sin. It's like a mirror that reveals the problem to us. 
Now let's look back to verse 21 for a second. Paul shows us a third purpose of the law in verse 21, and that is that the law cannot give spiritual life. In fact, by not giving spiritual life, it proves our spiritual deadness. So, our last point here concerning the collaboration of law and grace, that the law cannot give life. Is the law then, verse 21, contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. Listen, laws are regulatory. They control people. They keep them in line. They try to avoid the chaos of having a lawless society. They're designed to maintain order and avoid anarchy. That's the purpose of laws. And most definitely the law of Moses kept people in line for the most part. But it could never provide spiritual life to the people. Consider two passages in Galatians now which we have encountered. One from chapter 2 and one from chapter 3. Both of them verse 21. Right here in this verse... Verse 21 of chapter 3. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. Back in chapter 2, verse 21, Paul had already said this. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. These two passages, these two verses need to be connected here. Because he's emphasizing the same thing. The law is not contrary to the promises of God. The law plays a role. It drives us to the Savior because trying to adhere to the law perfectly is an exercise in absolute futility. The law drives us to him and by God's grace we are saved. So, if spiritual life and righteousness could have come through the law, then what would have been the point of Jesus dying on the cross? Paul is basically asking that question. It would have been an unnecessary act, completely worthless, if the argument of the Judaizers is adopted by those Galatian believers and anyone who would believe. But Jesus did die. We know that. Jesus did die because the law could never give the sinner life and righteousness. That was the point of Christ's sacrifice. That is why he died, to give people life who were dead in their sin, which brings us really to how we can summarize this all up and capture it in one thought right now, our big idea. What is it that points us to Christ? The law points us to Christ. Who gives us grace to believe, which results in life. It gives us life. It gives us life. So as we conclude today, in God's economy of salvation, law and grace do not oppose each other. There is actually a collaboration of law and grace. It is not that law is bad and grace is good. That's not Paul's point. It is not that God's covenant with Abraham is good and God's giving of the law to Moses was bad. It's not like the replacement of the Articles of Confederation with the United States Constitution. It's not like that at all. God didn't replace one covenant with another because he had erred. The bottom line is this. The law drives us to the cross. It is like a mirror for us to see our own sin. And when we're driven to the point of despair about our own sin, to the point where we would confess our sin and repent, which means to turn around and head in the other direction, enter the grace of God and the faith to believe in the only one who is able to give a dead man life. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. I quite like how David Gutzik kind of captured it in his one statement, and it is this, and this is how I want us to close for today. He said this, quote, Only faith can break us out of our confinement to sin. The law of Moses can show us clearly our problem in God's standard. 
but it cannot give us the freedom that only Jesus can give. The freedom is given to those who believe. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Father, for your grace and and that by your grace and by faith alone, we are indeed justified. I thank you, Father, for the role of the law in our lives, which was meant to drive us to the point of despair, to be able to see our own sin and know that because of our sin, there's absolutely nothing that an unholy, unrighteous, bad person can do to merit their own salvation. How can a dead man raise himself? We thank you, Father, for teaching us that we can't, that it was only the work of your son Jesus, the finished work of Christ on the cross that enables us to be saved. We thank you for your, for salvation, which is by your grace and through faith alone. Father, I just pray that you would continue to remind us by the power of your Holy Spirit as we live our lives of the wonderful grace of God which sent his one and only son to Calvary's tree to purchase redemption for all of us. Thank you. And we are in awe that you would love us so much that you would do that for us. We thank you for the free gift of salvation, Father. And if there be anyone here today who does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, I just pray, Father, that they would not step out of these walls without having that assurance that Christ has done it all on the cross. Thank you, Father, for this time. I pray for your richest blessing on all of us as we reflect on this truth from your servant, Paul. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.